Good morning, everyone. I feel like I'm a long way from you, uh, but I can see you, and hopefully you can see me, and it just works out better for the, the live stream to do this from up here, and I know you're used to that with, with Scott and whoever else was here before Scott taught the last quarter, so uh, it's good. It's been a while since I've been in the auditorium on a Sunday morning for class, so uh, I'm, I'm grateful to have this opportunity. This quarter is actually going to be a little quarter plus because we're going to try to sync up some things at the beginning of next year that you'll hear more about between now and then. So we're actually going to take four months in this study rather than three, which means we've got the luxury of a little more time and don't have to go quite so fast as we often have to do in, in studies like this. So. I'm grateful that, that you're a part of this class, and I look forward to, to sharing these next four months with you as we look at First and Second Timothy and Titus, which we will consider in the order of First Timothy, and then Titus, and then Second Timothy, and we'll talk about why a little later this morning. Uh, these three letters are often referred to as the pastoral epistles or the pastoral epistles, depending on how you pronounce that. Uh, that's not a, a title that Scripture itself applies to this grouping of, of three letters, but it's been a description that's been around for about 400 years, so people kind of get used to things over the period of 400 years or so. It was actually in the early 1700s, 1703 to be precise, that a biblical scholar named D.A. Bordeaux uh, referred to these three letters, letters as the pastoral epistles. And then Paul Anton, a little later in that century, in 1726. And so the title just sort of caught on and stuck. And you know how things are when they catch on and stick. They stay stuck uh, for a long, long time, it seems. And the reason these three letters were always not always, for a long time had been viewed as a group, was the same reason uh, why other letters in the New Testament are sometimes considered as groups, like we do with Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon, referring to those as the captivity letters or the prison epistles, because they're all written by Paul within the same historical context. The content, you know, if our, our text that was read the last two Sundays, uh, the same text during our worship assembly, uh, was from Ephesians chapter 4. The reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 3, a very, very, very parallel reading from an entirely different letter, but he's hitting the same things. Uh, because apparently Christians in Colossae were str struggling with a lot of things that the Christians in Ephesus were. Uh, and Paul's writing from the same... Uh, setting, historical setting and context of, of imprisonment. So, you know, it's not unusual to have a Sunday morning study or a Wednesday night study on those prison epistles. Well, First and Second Timothy and Titus are much the same in that they, they bear a lot of similar content, not exact, not precise, but, but similar content. And they're written roughly within the same period of time. They are written to individuals, as opposed to churches, but as we go through the study, you're going to find out that even though Timothy is addressed directly and Titus is addressed directly, there's this sneaking suspicion that's correct that Paul has that the church in Ephesus is going to be reading over Timothy's shoulder. And the churches in Crete are going to be reading over Titus's shoulder. And some of the U's, Y-O-U's that appear in our English translation are actually y'alls uh, in, in Greek. You know, we don't distinguish in English between you, Lisa, and you, the auditorium class. Uh, Greek does between singular you and y'all. And the, near the end of, of these letters, there are some y'alls that appear because, you know, Paul has in mind, I'm writing to you, Timothy, I'm writing to you, Titus, but I'm writing for the benefit of the body. I'm writing for the benefit of the church and not just for you personally. Uh, the, the term pastoral or pastoral, I, I used to say pastoral all the time. Seems like I catch myself saying pastoral more uh, in recent times, but 
just by definition, that English word has to do with things of or related to or corresponding to shepherding or, or herding. That's why uh, a pastoral scene is a rural scene, also peaceful, idyllic. That, that, that sort of thing goes along with uh, the adjective uh, pastoral. But it's also related to the leadership of churches and ministry to churches because of the shepherding that is involved in that work. Uh, so we talk about pastoral counseling. We talk about pastoral care. Um, care and compassion that happens within the flock of God. Counseling that not only happens within the confines of the flock of God, but a from a perspective of the shepherd himself for his sheep. So that's why this term is applied to these epistles because a significant portion of the material in all three letters has to do with the pastoral care, the shepherding care of the church. And so it's not surprising in that context that both 1 Timothy and Titus would deal with qualities of life and character and faith and experience, um, reputation that are musts among elders, overseers, shepherds in the body of Christ. So while the, the scripture itself doesn't apply that word to these letters, I, I think it's a very accurate description. So as examples of material from these three letters that deal with concerns about God's flock... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Paul writes, Although I hope to come to you soon, what we'll find as we get into the text of 1 Timothy next week is, you know, the setting for that letter is that Timothy has been left in Ephesus to continue setting things in order and continue combating some things that need combat combating. But Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but... I'm writing these instructions so that if I'm delayed, if I don't show up when I think I will, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Similarly, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Titus, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Um, the churches in Crete need shepherding. I'm charging you with appointing shepherds in those churches. And then 1 Timothy 3, 5, uh, in regard to Timothy's Paul's description to Timothy of those qualities of life, faith, character, reputation, experience, and so forth that should typify uh, leaders among God's people. He says, in, in regard to management of one's own household, he says, if they don't know how to manage their own household, how can they take care of God's church? While I'm concerned about how these men relate to their wives and their children, that's only as a basis for my concern about how they relate to the body of Christ, how effectively they lead, what kind of examples they are, and so forth. Uh, we are accepting the fact that Paul wrote these letters to Timothy and Titus. That notion was unquestioned until the 18th century, 19th century. The, the evidence for Paul's authorship of, of this three, these three letters are internal and external. The internal evidence is Paul saying, hey, Timothy... It's Paul. Titus, it's Paul. And all kinds of references in these letters to the relationship that existed between the apostle and these two young true sons in the faith. The external evidence comes from a long, long list of early Christian writers in the second and third centuries who unanimously said, Paul wrote these letters. They, they were accepted as both Pauline and as canonical. And so that's just the view of the early church. There's no question about it until um, liberal biblical scholarship in the mid to late 1800s uh, started questioning 
the vocabulary, the use of vocabulary uh, in these three letters, the description of church organization, references to trips that Paul had made that aren't referenced in the book of Acts. Uh, so those were the bases upon which some people who rejected the inspiration of Scripture to start with started questioning whether Paul, uh, whether Saul of Tarsus, who became a Christian, actually wrote these letters. Uh, but the strength of evidence, both internally and externally, is strong, and we should have no cause to doubt that. But it's the references in these three pastoral epistles the references to Paul's trips that aren't chronicled by Luke in the book of Acts, that, that's the primary reason that uh, this view came into being about Paul's release. You know, Luke leaves Paul in confinement in Rome at the end of Acts 28. You know, when, when that record is written... Paul has been there for two years. He's basically under house arrest. He can receive guests. They can leave. He's, he's converting people. He's preaching and teaching, but you know he's got the equivalent of a first century electronic ankle bracelet on. Uh, he's he's got to stay where he is. He can't leave Rome. He can't leave the house where he is. Uh, he's in a minimum security situation. But... When you read what Paul writes to Timothy and Titus, uh, we start getting this picture that's verified by early Christian writers in the 2nd and 3rd century and church historians like, like Eusebius. Um, we get to fill in some things into the chronology that go beyond what Luke records. So what seems to happen is while he's in that confinement in Rome, he writes Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon while in captivity, while imprisoned. And then he's released for lack of evidence. Um, Nero is already emperor at this time, but this is before the time that Nero sours on, on Christians. Had it been afterwards, Paul would have never gotten out of confinement the first time. But apparently during that time, Paul's able to travel again. Uh, probably even reaching his goal that he describes at the end of, of Romans of wanting to go to Spain. Uh, some early Christian witnesses say he, he made it to the extremity of the West. The extremity of the West. Some people say, well, maybe that was just Rome. People say, no, maybe it was really the extremity of the West, of, of Western Europe at that time, which would have been Spain. And that during those years of freedom, uh, which would have been maybe three or four years, he wrote 1 Timothy and he wrote Titus. And then he's rearrested, confined once again in Rome, and in that confinement writes 2 Timothy shortly before his death. And that's a chronology I'm going to be following in this study. Okay, so next week when we get into the text of 1 Timothy, we're going to assume that, that Paul writes this letter to Timothy in Ephesus while Paul himself, I mean, Paul himself says at the beginning of the letter, uh, before I took off to Macedonia, I left you there in Ephesus. And this is going to be between those, those imprisonments. And that's why we're going to study Titus next and then we'll circle back to 2 Timothy because it's at a little, little later time. But it's really references in these three letters that help us piece together that extended chronology that goes beyond what Luke records in, um, in the book of Acts. I'll have a breakdown for you next week of what we're going to try to cover each week, and again, we're going to have the luxury of going to the end of December rather than just the, the end of November. And each week in preparation for the discussion of those various sections of text, which I'll hand out to you next week. So if you want to follow along, if you want to kind of prepare each week for that, that, that would be fine. That would be great. And I'm going to make a point of reading that text from the vantage point of at least five translations. 
and that'll be the NIV and the ESV and the New American Standard Bible, the new, new, New American Standard Bible. There was the original New American Standard Bible, and then there was the 1995 New American Standard Bible. Now there's, now there's the new, new, new New American Standard uh, Bible. I think 2020 was the copyright date on that. So I'll start with the NIV, but I'll consult the, the ESV and the New American Standard Bible and the New Living Translation, and, and I'll probably throw in the message there just to see what Peterson does with, with that text, uh, which in some places is, is just incredibly insightful, and in some places it's like, Eugene, what in the world were you thinking uh, when, when you wrote that? So it, it is of uh, not as reliable help as standard English translations. So let's talk about the, the particulars that are involved in these letters, again, that we're referring to as the pastoral epistles. Um, we've got an author, Paul. And we know this guy, right? You've been talking about this guy since you were a kid in Bible class. Uh, you, you taught Bible classes years ago about his missionary journeys. You had flannel graphs based on the missionary journeys of Paul. And so just, just throw, throw, some, throw some stuff at me biographically about him. What do we know about this guy? He's okay. He's, he's got a trade. He's, he's a tent maker or a leather worker, depending on how you, you translate that. But being a rabbi was not the only thing he had ever been or a religious leader before converting to, to Christianity. So he's, he's got a trade. Maybe his, his father was a tent maker, leather worker. What else do you know about him? He's, he's educated and he's a Roman citizen. Okay. So, and he's a Roman citizen because he paid so much for it? No, he, he was born, he had citizenship from birth, and it, it's related, got to be, to his parents then. His father had to have been a Roman citizen in Tarsus, in Cilicia, which is a long, long way from Jerusalem. I mean, we're used to Bible stuff taking place there. I mean, occasional jaunts down into Egypt or over into Babylon or up into, a, uh, you know, northeast and into Assyria. But where he is born is a long way from Jerusalem, but he grows up in Jerusalem, according to what he says in Acts 22. That, that's his first defense in Jerusalem when, when he is arrested. And he makes this defense on the steps of the temple there. So... Uh, and then educated, when he gets to Jerusalem, he is privileged to study under the tutelage of what noted Pharisaical rabbi? Gamaliel, okay? I was surprised at how many times that name appears in the Old Testament just as a name. So it's a common Jewish name. Uh, but Gamaliel is, the, the, if, if you can get a graduate assistantship with Gamaliel, um, you, you've done something. And to be able to study under him, he's, he's not the wise guy. He's the wise man in the Sanhedrin in Acts 5 that says, you guys might, might want to tread lightly in regard to these people who, who follow the way. You know, if, if this thing is from men, it'll run its course as things always do, you know. Movements come, movements go. People get excited, people get unexcited. But if this thing is from God... You know, you don't want to find yourself fighting against God. So, you know, he appears in the New Testament for the first time there. We don't know his connection with, with Paul until Paul tells us later through Luke that, yeah, I studied under Gamaliel, which means he's a Pharisee, which means he's a part of an already elite group of people. A lot of scholars believe there were only about 4,000 Pharisees uh, at the time of the life of Christ in the early church. So it's a select group, and they acted like select groups often act. Very elitist, uh, very self-righteous, very superior in regard to other people. So you take that and then throw this graduate school with, with Gamaliel on there, and there aren't many people like him. There aren't many people like him. This is even before his, his conversion, okay? So 
Um, citizen from Tarsus, Pharisee, what tribe? Somebody said it, I heard it. No, it wasn't Levi. Benjamin, okay? And probably his namesake was the most famous Benjamite in the Old Testament, who was Saul, son of Kish. So, you know, kid born centuries later in the tribe of Benjamin, um, you know, may, maybe he's named after King Saul. That's, that's his Hebrew name. So we know a lot about the, the author. And then, you know, you get to Acts, end of Acts 6, and Stephen encounters opposition from this synagogue of the freedmen who was in, that was in Jerusalem. And there were, this, this, this synagogue seems to have been um, comprised of Hellenistic Jews, Greek-speaking Jews, those who may have grown up in, in the diaspora, and it gives several place names where the constituents of that synagogue had come from, including Cilicia, which is Saul's home turf. And so when opposition comes from the synagogue and they drag Stephen to the, the Sanhedrin, before whom he makes his defense and by whom he's dragged outside the city to be stoned, um, and as Stephen asked the Lord to, to pardon them, to forgive them, and not hold this sin against them, as he prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, uh, his attackers, his executors, lay their outer garments at Saul's feet. So some, some suggest that maybe even as a young man, he's already a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, maybe he's just as a student of, of Gamaliel, former student of Gamaliel, he's an apprentice, and so he's not actually. And, and it may be that these members of the Sanhedrin are so self-righteous and, and have a way of rationalizing things mentally that they're, they're happy to condemn somebody to death, but they won't get their hands dirty in doing it, you know? So, so maybe they give the execution order and Saul and the others aren't going to get their hands dirty, you know. Um, maybe that's why Jesus said, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. Maybe they were, they were so used to, um, you know, giving orders for execution, but not personally being involved in it. But that's our introduction to Saul, uh, as far as the chronology of, of the text of, of Acts. And then... Be the beginning of chapter 8 just says persecution begins in earnest, disciples scatter, and we don't learn to the beginning of chapter 9 that Saul's the instigator behind this. He, he's the one who's driving this, this push. And you understand why these people have shown up on the radar of the religious leaders in, in Jerusalem. Okay, remember that was the end of chapter 6 where opposition uh, against Stephen arose. It's in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, just two chapters earlier, where we're told that the number of male disciples had increased to 5,000. So you think a lot of those guys are married, a lot of those guys have kids, maybe 20,000, 25,000 men, women, and children in Jerusalem are now associated with this movement called the Way that's associated with Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and they're meeting daily. In the temple courts, they're meeting from house to house all over the city. Um, you know, it's, it probably dawns on them, you know, we should have started trying to contain this wildfire earlier. And, and you know how these wildfires work? I mean, it's, uh, you know, these poor people out, out west, you know, in California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, you know, millions of acres going up. Trying to contain those things is so, so hard. That's what they see here. And so, you know, you fight fire with fire. And that's, that's where this push comes from because they realize we, we may already be late in this game in, in opposing this. So Saul shows up in chapter 9 as the one who's driving this. So he's the one who gets letters from the high priest to go 120 miles looking for more of them in the city of Damascus. That's how far... Christianity has already spread. 
that he's going to go 120 miles north into Syria to Damascus to arrest people there, haul them back in chains um, to, to Jerusalem for prosecution. And we know the trip doesn't go according to his plan. Uh, the trip goes according to God's plan. And uh, God taps him on the shoulder by shining a light in his eyes uh, to the point that, that it blinds him for three days, uh, speaks to him. He has, has a conversation with the one that he would have bet every penny he had was dead. Jesus of Nazareth was dead, and his followers are delusional, and he was a liar, and his followers are liars, and they're blasphemers, and I'm going to do everything I can to squish out every last dying ember of their movement because he's dead. And then that guy appears to you in divine light and speaks to you. Um, that, that's, you know, a pivotal point in your life, in your heart, in your soul, in, in your eternity, everything. So just quickly, you know, we follow him there from Damascus with his conversion back to Jerusalem. Uh, the hunter quickly becomes the hunted. Both in, that's why he has to leave Damascus at night in a bat. How undignified, you know, for this uh, esteemed rabbi to have to sneak out of town in a basket through a window let down by a rope at night in Damascus just to stay alive. Gets to Jerusalem, and guess what? Nobody, rolls, nobody among the Christians rolls out a welcome you know, uh, mat for him and, and says, so nice to have you on our side, brother. Everybody's scared to death of him because they've always been scared to death of him ever since persecution began, except for that dear son of encouragement. Good old Joseph of Cyprus, uh, good old Barnabas, takes him to the apostles. But that doesn't stop the Jews in Jerusalem from wanting to kill him. So the hunter becomes the hunted, and he, he goes back home. He goes back to Tarsus. I don't know how long he had been in Jerusalem, uh, where he says he grew up, but he goes back to his, his hometown. And I don't know if he's got a plan at that point. Because that's where he is when Barnabas goes to find him in Acts chapter 11 to bring him to Antioch to help him out with this new, expansive, growing church in Antioch, uh, largely made up of Gentiles. And then it's from there that he and Barnabas and John Mark set out on their first journey. Why am I telling you all this? Because this is how he gets in context. This how, is how he gets in contact with Timothy. This is how he meets Timothy. So with Barnabas and John Mark, Holy Spirit says, you know, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Still Barnabas and Saul at this point, you know. Saul's the junior partner in this, in this relationship. And Barnabas' relative, cousin, John Mark is there. And it, it was God's idea for those two to go. It was their idea for John Mark to go. And, and that seems to be okay with God. Seems to be okay with the Holy Spirit that they got to use their idea in that too. Except it didn't turn out like Barnabas thought it would. Um, but he sticks with them through preaching from one end of the island of Cyprus to the other. And then they hit the mainland of Asia Minor at a place called Perga. And that's where John Mark, for whatever reasons, homesickness, homesickness or discouragement or this isn't what I thought I was signing up for. He goes back. And Paul and Barnabas continue to Antioch, another Antioch. Um, that was one of, Antiochus was one of um, Alexander the Great's generals. And so, actually it was Seleucus, whose father's name was Antioch. So when, when Seleucus gets a, about a fourth of Alexander the Great's kingdom, after his death, he just starts naming everything after his dad. Uh, Antiochus, yeah, you know, so there's Antioch here and Antioch there. They're sent from Antioch of, of Syria. They go to Antioch of Pisidia. And then they go to Iconium and Lystra. And it's at Lystra where some incredible things happen. And this is where Timothy lives. This is where Lois lives. This is where Eunice lives is in Lystra. And that's in Acts chapter 16, which bears the reading of, of a few verses. Uh, 
Uh, we'll get to Acts 16 by and by. We've got to go back a little bit to chapter 14. Verses 14 through 18. Um, so what leads up to the reading of, of this text is that they heal, Paul and Barnabas heal a man in Lystra who had been lame from birth. So the crowds, the pagan crowds, think that they are pagan gods. Uh, that's the only gods they know. They don't know Yahweh. They don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, they may know some Jews, but they don't know the God of, of the Jews. So they assume that Barnabas is Zeus or Jupiter and Paul is Hermes or Merc Mercury because he's the, the chief spokesman of the two. So the priest of Zeus brings a sacrifice to offer to them, and this is where they object. Verse 14 of Acts 14. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes, rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, uh, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let the nations go their own way. That's, that's you guys here in Lystra. You just let you go your own way. Uh, yet he didn't leave himself without testimony. He has shown kindness to you by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd uh, from sacrificing to them. They begged and they pleaded, please, 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 you know, don't embarrass yourselves. Don't, don't dishonor God by making sacrifice to us. How long does it take to go from a God to a goat? Not greatest of all time goat, but a goat goat. Uh, it takes one verse. It takes one verse to go from God to goat. Verse 19, then some Jews from Antioch and Iconium, the last two places they got run out of town, they came and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the th city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, notice they had already been there long enough to make some disciples. When they gathered around him, he got up and did something I don't think I would have had the guts or the bravery or the courage to do. He goes back into the city to let them know they didn't complete the job, to let them know they weren't successful. I, I think Tim Piles would have been looking for some dust on my feet to shake off and protest against them at that point and, and head on down the line, get out my map, figure out what the next, next place is. He goes back into the city. And I think that, that has to impress, probably angers some of the people who were involved in attacking him. But I can't imagine what it did to the hearts and the minds of the people who witnessed it, the disciples. And I think three of those disciples are Lois and Eunice and Timothy. We don't meet them yet, but they're from Lystra. And it's going to be on the next, the next not the next swing through, uh, which is going to be in very short order, but the swing through town after that, that, that he picks up Timothy. Um, and the only place after that is Derby, and that's where he and Barnabas say, hey, let's go back, visit all these disciples in these places where we've just been. Let's point elders in all those churches, which they do. And um, I think a witness to all those things was Timothy. So... That's all first missionary journey of Paul. Second missionary journey, you know what happens. Uh, there's counsel in, verse, in Acts chapter 15 to sort out the craziness that was being imposed on gen, male Gentile converts, you know, trying to say that they had to be circumcised in order to be saved, and binding various aspects of the law. So Paul and Barnabas are sent from Antioch to, to help sort that out. Uh, with the apostles, and then they go back to Antioch, and it's there that they decide, hey, let's go back to Derby and Lystra and Iconium and Antioch and, and see how those churches are doing. Let's encourage those elders that we appointed. And Barnabas is all ready to load up. You know, he tells John Mark, start packing your bags. We got another trip. And, you know, Paul says, not in this lifetime. 
Uh, am I going on another trip with him? And disagreed about it, disagreed over methodology so sharply that, that they parted ways, which God says, okay, I'll use that. You know, I'll take my one powerhouse mission team and make two powerhouse mission teams out of it. So Barnabas and John Mark get on a boat and sail to Cyprus the way the first journey went. And Paul takes Silas, who had come up from Jerusalem, and they go by land through Cilicia. Let's see, where else? Syria and Cilicia. So I can't imagine Paul not taking Silas through Tarsus and saying, hey, that's the house where I was born. Um, showed him some sites, sites around town. I mean, they go through Cilicia. I think they got to go through Tarsus. But the beginning of chapter 16 lets us know what happens when they get back to Lystra? Remember, this is the place where they, he had his life. A serious attempt had been made on his life to the point that they thought they had stoned him so thoroughly that, that they succeeded. They thought he was, he was dead. So chapter 16, book of Acts, verse 1, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish, uh, and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium, which is the next city over to the west, uh, spoke well of Timothy. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey, which included the instruction, you don't have to be circumcised, which is interesting. Uh, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and, and grew in numbers. Um, so we, we start learning things about Timothy in rapid fire succession as well. Uh, mother was Jewish, father was a Gentile, father gets to say so, and I'm not having my boy circumcised. I, I know that, you know, Eunice, your brothers probably were, you know, when they were born, but, but not our son, not a, not a son from, from this marriage. And we learn from 2 Timothy 1.5, um, we'll get there after our study of Titus, Paul writes, I'm reminded, Timothy, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. Chapter 3 of that letter, verses 14 and 15. From infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So I think there, there are one or two or three possible scenarios here that, that are being referenced. Um, it's possible but I don't think likely that Lois and Eunice, mother and daughter, became disciples on the first mission, missionary journey. And now that, you know, Paul has arrived a second time, Timothy becomes a Christian. I don't think he got a, enough time for him to have this reputation that he has among the disciples in Lystra and Iconium. Um, so I, I think the long-standing knowledge of the scriptures and faith that his mother and grandmother had is a reference to, to their, their time in Judaism, before their conversion even. I mean, they were serious followers of the law. They, they took seriously the covenant that God had made with Israel. And... So what I envision, I can't prove this, it's just kind of a chronology that makes sense to me, is that on the first missionary trip, when he ends up being stoned and comes back into the city and the disciples gather around him, I think among those disciples were the new, recently converted Lois and Eunice and Timothy, three generations of, of the same family. And that during the intervening time, this young man, which even when Paul writes the first letter to him, he, he reference him, references him being young. Maybe he's a teenager, uh, a, a, an older teen, maybe in his young 20s at the time Paul arrives there now and wants to take him along. But um, it doesn't, it's, it's not beyond comprehension that all three generations in that family 
from their strong knowledge of, of the scriptures came to see Jesus of Nazareth as the fulfillment of those scriptures through the preaching of Paul and Barnabas the first time. Um, that's what happened with my, my, with my mom and my maternal grandparents uh, outside of Blakely, Georgia in a little unincorporated place called Hen Town. Hen is in chicken. Uh, Hen Town, Early County, Georgia, extreme southwest Georgia. And I'm assuming that before 1951, uh, I, I think they were members of a Baptist church like most people in rural South Georgia were at the time and maybe still are. And I can't remember the preacher's name. He was based in Montgomery, Alabama, but he, he came and held a brush arbor meeting in 1951 uh, near their home. And my grandmother, uh, Lila Mae Massey Sheffield, and my grandfather, Charles Randall Sheffield, and my mom, 15-year-old Shelby Jean Sheffield, uh, were all baptized uh, at the same time. Mom, dad, daughter. Uh, older sister, Eleanor, had already, she was already married and had left home. Uh, she was baptized later. But, you know, I... I it was only seven, you know, I think about Brush Harbor meetings in the Deep South, you know, and it seems like so long ago, but it was only 70 years ago in 1951. I'm almost 60, so 70 years can't be that long. Um, but, you know, it, it was a transformational time for them. But, you know, Charles Randall Sheffield knew the scriptures. Lila May Massey Sheffield knew the scriptures. They, they were people of faith. They were people of knowledge of the word, like Eunice and Lois were. And when, like Apollos, they were taught the way of the Lord more accurately, they did what you do when, when, that, when that happens. Um, and and it's, it's wonderful when extended members of the, of the same family um, come to saving faith in Christ at, at the same time. Uh, I've had some wonderful baptism experiences uh, over, over the last 35 years, not nearly all of them in baptistries, um, in oceans, in ponds, in rivers, in tubs, uh, all kinds of places. But one of the most memorable in a baptistry was at the Walnut Hill Church in, in Dallas uh, when... Glenn and Tricia Worsham and their two teenage daughters were all baptized uh, on the same Sunday morning. And all of us were just down in there in the baptistry together. You know, mom, dad, and two, uh, two teenage girls. And it was just like, you know, who wants to go first? And I don't even remember who went first. I just remember it was incredible, you know, to, to see these multiple generations in this family. And, and a, I don't, Glenn, I'd, if, if anybody's watching online that knows Glenn Worsham, former Dallas police officer, maybe still Dallas police officer. He was the nephew of our primary administrative assistant, uh, Martha Evans, who's now passed, as has her mother, Murtis Worsham. Uh, so anybody with Walnut Hill ties, love to you guys. And if anybody knows where Glenn is, have him, have him send me an email. But... Uh, just, you know, Glenn and Tricia, I can't remember the, the girls' names. But I, I think, I, I sense that's what happens with Lois and Eunice and Timothy on the first trip. And then Paul comes back sometime later. Timothy has grown, he has matured, he is impressed. He, he has um, impacted a lot of people with his reputation. And Paul says to Silas, I think we need this guy on our journey. And he will be with them for much of this, the rest of that second journey and the third journey. And I think that's a pretty good place for us to stop today. I think there's a, a bell that's about to ring. So uh, we'll finish just a few introductory things about um, these three letters, wrap up some stuff about Timothy, since he's in Ephesus, we'll talk about what we know about the church in that place, both before Timothy's time and after Timothy's time. Because I think we know, other than the church in Jerusalem, I think from various sources in the New Testament, we know more about 
the church in Ephesus than just about any other first century church. Based on Paul's three years there, he writes them a letter. Timothy is there when he receives this letter. And the, whole, the Father through the Son, through the Holy Spirit, through John the Revelator is going to send a letter to that same church a few decades later. So we get snapshots of, of the, the church in Ephesus all throughout that. So we'll, we'll finish up some introductory things next week and then get into the text of 1 Timothy 1.